All right. So Cindy Goldaddy is an educational consultant and a 4-H mom who is fascinated with the connections between the mind and body. She uses these strategies she's learned to coach horse blend hippology in Anoka County, teach as a college professor, and just be a mom. As her daughter, I can testify these methods improve your riding and really do work. So let's all direct our attention to Cindy Goldaddy as she teaches us how exercise and nutrition affect your riding. <clears throat> all right, it always helps to unmute yourself. Thank you, Leah, for that great introduction. So to get started, I think Leah did a pretty good job talking about me. She said it was really hard to introduce her own mom. But the talk that was that the committee came up with is how exercise and nutrition affect your writing. So we only have 45 minutes. And as we go through, I'm gonna be asking you to share in the chat. So I have an iPad set up next to me with the chat so I can track everybody. So we're going to keep moving really fast because exercise could be a 24 or a 32 hour course and nutrition could also be that kind of course at the college level. So we're really just giving little snippets today. And I thought we would start with nutrition and just spend like 10 minutes on that and then spend a big chunk of time on your body and exercise. All right, so to get us going, let's see what comes next here. A little bit about me, I'm a 4-H volunteer, I coach apology and horse bowl, I'm the Dan Patch committee chair, I'm the leader council adult advisor president for Anoka County and I run the county food booth when we have a food booth and when we have a fair. I'm also an online educator, I teach all around the world and now I teach doing that all on screen, on Zoom. And I love to learn so I put on there I'm a serial learner. So you may know me through one of these kids that are showing up here. On the left is Leah, who just introduced me. The middle is Aaron, who you heard him talking yesterday. He was the farrier on the career panel, and he'll be speaking this afternoon. And then Nathan just pretends to be a cowboy and pretends to ride horse. So this is at his graduation. He actually did one loop around the arena and, and wrote a little paragraph about himself that caused a lot of laughs. All right. So to jump in, today is not going to be about the knowledge of how to ride a horse. It's not going to be about the emotion of, do I feel frustrated with me and my horse? Am I sad? Am I happy? Instead, we're going to be talking about our bodies, what we put in our bodies, how we use them, how we warm them up, and how they can help us to be the best rider that we can be. So we're gonna start with nutrition. Food equals fuel. So if you think of your body as like a car or some sort of machine, how do you fuel it? So I want you to think back to a horse show that you were at or to think ahead to a horse show that you're going to this spring or this summer. Imagine or remember what foods do you pack for that long day at the horse show and put some of those foods in the chat. What do you bring with for food and beverages? Allison, you're crashing my party. You put carrots down. Way to go. That's what we're looking for. I love carrots. Carrots are my life. <laughs> That's cool. Carrots, apples, sandwiches, more carrots, cheese sticks, Gatorade, water, meat, peanuts. And then I see some chips. Chips, oh. chips, and chips. Taco dip. Oh, that was Leah G. Yes, we usually bring that layered taco dip. Beef sticks, Powerade, apples, pancakes, cucumbers. So those are great things. And that's why I wanted you to see what's on this picture that I found. On the one side, you have your fruits and vegetables. And then on the other side, you have your cupcakes, or you might think of it as junk food. And this is really important when you're thinking of, wow, I wanna go to a horse show and I wanna do my very best and I want my body to do what it says. What am I feeding it? How am I fueling it? And if you're living off donuts and garbage from the gas station that you stopped on the way to the horse show, you might not be at your optimum, you know, at eight o'clock at night when you're doing four in a line. You might kind of be crashed. 
So think all of you horse bowl and hippology people, you should know these answers. And I put it up there right away. What are the three macronutrients that horses need and that humans need? Carbs, fats, and proteins. So now look through that chat list and just check off. What do you see on there? Do you see carbs listed? That would be your sandwiches and your breads and your chips. Do you see fats listed? That's your cheese sticks. And do you see proteins listed? Your beef sticks, your meat. So we want some of all of that. We want to make sure that when we show up, that we show up with a balanced array of foods to help us. So if we're feeling really sluggish after lunch, we want some quick energy. So we want some carbs. But maybe in the morning, we want to give ourselves some protein and fat. So maybe some eggs. You know, I didn't see many people say, I bring boiled eggs along. Hard boiled egg gives you a lot of your fat and your protein. So to just think about those macronutrients. And then the other thing is that other big macronutrient, water. Your horse needs water. That was one of the questions Josie just asked. But also we need water because you also were asked the question, how much of a horse's body is made up of water and how much of your body is made up of water? It's very similar that we are water and whatever your percentage is, your brain is a higher percentage of water than the rest of you. So if you're dehydrated because it's 90 degrees out and you're drinking Coke and Pepsi, what's that going to do when you go to run barrels? or when you're going through the keyhole, are you going to be able to make your best decisions if your brain is so thirsty for water? So a lot of times if I'm seeing kids have meltdowns or anxiety or panic or just extreme sadness or any of those emotions, I go straight to the water. Have you drank anything today that's not carbonated? You know, just simple things to drink some water. So going kind of super fast here because I'm really into the exercise piece and what we can do physically with our bodies. But to sum it up, junk food is not what you should be bringing to a horse show. Now, I love some of those things on there. And those of you that come to Horse Bowl, you know that I always have a big bag of peanut M&Ms at our table. I love peanut M&Ms and I say, well, the peanut part is good for me, right? That's the nuts. And so I rationalize that that's okay. But if we're just living on donuts with all sorts of food coloring and Doritos with all sorts of junk and you know everything else that you see in this picture and the soda pop, that's not going to help you do your very best. So when we think about how does nutrition affect your writing, it affects your decision-making, your ability to react so just think if your horse decides to do a quick stop at jumping figure eight instead of going over the top. Are you able to change position and react and save yourself or do you land on the ground? That you need that ability to react and the foods that you feel yourself with are going to help with that. So just real quickly, any questions or comments about that before we jump ahead? All right, Gianna speaks for the group and Gianna, I happen to even know who you are. She says, nope, we're good. So here's your summary. Think about how you're fueling yourself. Really important as you prepare to get out there showing this year. So now I put a different picture on with our title slide. How does exercise affect your riding? And so look at that teeny little girl on that horse and how she's able to put her arms out in balance and know right where she is in space. So I know that last year I filled in at Winter Roundup and gave a talk just really off the cuff in my sweatpants without having a shower for two nights. And I first wanted to just ask if anyone had things they wanted repeated from last year. Otherwise, I have new things that I wanna share with you today. So if you have something you're really hoping I go over again, make sure you put it in the chat so that I can try to squeeze it in. All right, I'll keep looking at the chat. So as much as we're thinking about how do we fuel ourselves with food, we also wanna think about, you know, but how do I keep my body ready 
to ride? How do I keep it limber and flexible? How do I build up my muscles and which muscles should I be working on so that I can be the best rider I am? So I just found this cute picture. I thought it was super funny. And then a grease gun thinking about, you know, how do you make sure that your muscles are greased up and ready to go? So as we get going, first, let's talk about your horse. How do you get your horse ready to show? What do you do? And you can stick some ideas in the chat. Oh, you might give it a bath. Yeah, some physical relaxation and get it cleaned up. You might take them for a walk. Yeah, you warm them up first. You don't just go out and run full speed. Might do some lunging, some conditioning, some nutrition. So nutrition, Leah G takes us right back to the talk we just did. I skipped those questions I had about how do you feel your horse? But I hope you're all thinking of that. How does nutrition affect my horse as well as affect me? That you don't wanna be you know, popping a bunch of candy to your horse and then expect it to be calm. That you wanna think about what kind of feeds are you giving it? Are you using red cell or any of those other supplements that we can give just to help with joint health? with muscles, with body condition scoring and that percentage of body fat, all those things. Make sure they're healthy, clean them, trail ride to get a good mindset. Ooh, we all know some trainers that just talk a lot about trail riding. Stretching, massaging them, ride a little bit every day so it's not a Saturday only event and the horse has been hanging out all week with their buddies and then you think they're gonna go do their best. So all those things, and I think I just have one picture to show you, I think, there we go. <laughs> so I chose lunging as my picture just to represent all of this. Of we want to warm our horse up. And so now think about yourself. How do you prepare your body for a horse show? And we've already talked about nutrition, so you don't have to talk about what you eat, but what do you do for yourself? Or maybe you don't do anything and you're just going to say, hmm, in the chat. I haven't thought about it that way. Ava, that's a great one, sleep. Sleep is so underrated. It is so important that sleep helps you think better. It helps you process. Stretching, boy, lots of people know the importance of sleep. This is a hard one, especially when you get up at five in the morning to get your horse bathed and then to put them in the trailer and drive somewhere to a show. And what if you stayed up at night packing the trailer? So you really wanna do some time management with that. Listen to relaxing music. That's a great way to prepare yourself. Do a workout, do exercise, do sleep. Do some positive mindset, I think is what I saw. Focus and think about how I want the day to go. Relax, go for a walk. So all these things are great. And what I'm hoping I'm gonna give you now in our next half an hour together are some specific things in addition to everything you're already doing. So take that list that's in the chat. Those are all great strategies and I'm, going to just up-level some of those a little bit just to build us up. And why would we do that? Have you ever felt like this? And I'm sure that your horse has maybe had a day when they've acted like this, but have you ever been like this? Maybe you got off the horse after a ride and you had a little temper tantrum, or maybe the tears just came pouring out, or, Maybe you were so full of anxiety that your hands weren't doing the right things and your legs weren't doing the right things. So I thought this was super funny. I was looking all over for some picture to represent so that these are my talking points. I remember to touch on each point. So this is where we're gonna go. What can I do if I feel like this? And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see me and so I can see more of you. And we're gonna go over some strategies. All right, so there everyone is. There's a lot of us on. So what I was thinking we would do is work our way from head to toe. 
because you already covered the toes, go for a walk. So you already know how to work from the bottom up. So we're gonna go opposite. And think about when you're out receiving a horse lesson from someone, what is that trainer telling you about your hands and your eyes? <laughs> I see some nodding. You know exactly what I'm thinking, don't you? That we don't want you to always have to be looking down to see where are your hands. We want you to just know my hands live at the end of my arms and I know where my arms are and what position they're in. So I wanna give you an activity that you can do to help you have more awareness of your hands and how to just trust that they are where they are. Don't look at the horse, look at where you wanna go. That's right. But for some of us, if we haven't finished all of our reflex development or if we're feeling any stress, we go back into a very primitive space of safety so we're gonna do some strategies to help us be able to come out of that space. So the first activity I wanna do is a very early developmental activity that takes us way back to our preschool time. It's called the double doodle. So just take your favorite hand that you like to write with and doodle with it. Now we're going to do a double doodle. So what do you think that means? Both hands. So I'm gonna teach you how to do it. So get ready. We're gonna start down at the bottom and we're gonna take our arm, our hands and go straight up and out and down and in. Up, out, down, in. If you're in band, does this remind you of a conductor? So now the key is both hands have to do the same thing. That's the rule. And you may now get creative as long as both hands do the same thing. So they both can go out and in and out and in and out and in. You could draw a pine tree. It's pointy at the top. And then it gets bigger and bigger. You could draw a heart. We just had Valentine's Day. You could draw a bunch of little flowers. Maybe I'll put one over here. And one over here. Could draw a snowman. I don't know where all of you live, but we got a lot of snow this morning. It's over the top of my boots. So I could draw a snowman's head, their body, their bottom of their body. I could put a little carrot nose on there. I could put some buttons. I might give them arms. Okay. So now instead of looking so hard at me, look somewhere else away from the camera and just let your arms go. So they're both doing the same thing and let your eyes relax in the middle. So you're not looking so hard at your hands and breathe. So this is working on just knowing where your hands are. It's very, Developmental, if any of you have ever been around a baby and you put them in a high chair and give them food, what do they do with their food? They double doodle it. So they take mashed potatoes and they smoosh it around or pudding or peas and they squish the peas onto the high chair. So you're doing the same thing. You're just bringing it up here and doing it. You also, if you keep doing this, do you notice you're feeling your back muscles and your shoulders, especially if you go way out? And so this is also going to relax your upper back. So if you're someone that you get on that horse and everything gets tight and tense just in case they buck or just in case they don't listen, double doodles can be great. And remember that picture of that little preschooler on the horse, holding your arms out and balancing. You could do this while you sat on a horse when you wait for your run, doing some quick double doodles. So oh, that's my first one. Is that easy enough? Okay, so now we're gonna build on that and do one more for the eyes because as Shelby put in the chat, the eyes, look where you want to go. And Nora, don't look at the horse, look where you want to go. We want our eyes to know where they are and to not be so worried about our hands. So I'm gonna teach you a quick activity that comes from Vision Gym. So I teach 34 movements that help with eyes and I'm going to just do one or two today for you. All right. So we're gonna start with this shape. You see that this is a number eight. 
and we're going to call it a lazy eight because it's flipped on its side, it's horizontal. And you have that shape on your face, right around your eyes. So the first thing we're going to do is trace that shape around our eyes, touching our skin. So we're nice and light, just going up over our eyebrow, down to our cheekbone, up over the other eyebrow. Okay, everyone's got that under control. So we're gonna build on it. We're gonna make those bigger and bigger, but we're going to do this with our eyes closed. And every now and then, we're going to pause and pop our eyes open and see if they're looking at our thumb. So let me say it again. As I'm tracing with my eyes closed, I'm gonna have my eyeballs following where I think my fingers are. And every now and then I'm gonna stop my finger and pop my eyes open to see if I'm on target. Or am I too far ahead or am I too far behind, okay? So start on your face, eyes are closed. And then move your hands a little bit away from your face, make your lazy eight a little bit bigger, pause and pop your eyes open and look at your fingers. Close your eyes and keep going. A little bit bigger, pop and take a peek. Keep going, nice and big, as big as your hands can go, pop, take a peek. Pop. Now you're gonna start making your hands smaller again. Make that shape less and less and pop and take a peek whenever you want. All right. That was called infinity eights. I'll hold it up again just so you can see it. So infinity eights, we were doing lazy eights, flipped on their side and making them bigger and bigger and then opening our eyes to check, are we on target or not? This is important for us because it will help improve our eye-hand coordination. It will help fine and large motor skills and it will improve our perception of depth. Like how far is it to the jump? Where is the first barrel? And so that depth perception is huge. And also if you're a, you know, a teenage driver and you're driving at night, it helps with night vision. So for all of us moms and dads on here, this is a great one for us to do if we don't like driving at night anymore. All right, so there was one for the eyes. Any questions about that? I see some comments, that's brilliant, yeah. This is easy, we can do this. So then I was thinking, you know, we also wanna be able to have our vibration sensors know what they're doing, just like you want your horse's vibration sensors to be working. And we can think of our ears as vibration sensors because they bring in sound, which is vibration. So to start with this one, turn and look over your shoulders and notice how far can you look how does your neck feel? You just took a 30 question test on horse bull. So is anyone feeling tense? Look over your other shoulder. Can you look as far both directions or is one side different from the other side? One side's different from me because one side is facing a wall and the other side's facing a window. There you go. So you have something to look at versus a boring wall. Same with me, I can look this way and look out the window. All right, so let's play with this one. We're going to take and take our thumb behind our ear, our fingers in front of our ear. And we're going to just massage our ears from the top down to the bottom. So you're kind of, pretend that these are like an elephant's ears and you're opening them up. That's why your thumb is behind because your thumb is stronger than your finger. So you're just massaging from top to bottom. You can do both ears at once. And there's a doctor in Indonesia that I got to go and travel to and speak at a conference with him. And he talks about, you even can slow it down and just take your thumb behind your finger on top and just pull straight up. 
and feel your face muscles. And then what if you went to the middle and you pulled straight back and which face muscles do you feel now? I feel it go all the way to my nose <laughs> and then go down to the bottom of your ear and pull straight down. Okay, super. Now turn and look over your shoulders again and see if it's the same or different. Does your neck feel as tense? Can you look as far? Can you look further? And so if you have a difference, put it in the chat. I see Allison smiling. <laughs> so if there was something different, tell us what was different. Yeah, so Elizabeth and Madison said, wow, my neck doesn't hurt. And we didn't touch your neck at all. But what we did is you have so many muscles in your neck that all come up here and they have to attach somewhere. And a lot of them attach right around your ear. So when you play with your ear and massage it and pull on it and kind of wake it up, all these muscles get a little bit of attention without ever touching your neck. So really an easy way, again, can you see yourself doing that on a horse? And do you think it might affect your riding? It might help it for you to know where am I in space? You know, inside your ear is all of your ability to have your levelers of am I aware of what's straight up and down or am I off kilter? All right, I see tons of comments. Let's see, I feel less tense. My neck doesn't hurt. That's crazy. <laughs> I could look further. I could see further. I could stretch further um, in my neck. Okay. So we're just going to keep working our way down. We did our eyes and our ears. And then the next place I was thinking we would go was kind of to the, the whole body, which is really going to help the whole brain. And so we talked about this last year, and a lot of you put it in the chat. Oh, and what was that called? Abigail asked. That was called the thinking cap. So if you just think of the thinking cap. I'm going to turn on my thinking caps. Really great to do when you're in a conference like this, having to listen for so many hours on end. When you're at, at class, especially if you're still doing virtual learning, this is something that doesn't disturb anyone. And when you're in person, it also doesn't disturb anyone to play with your ears. It doesn't make any sound. So just a super powerful strategy. I use this one at church if I'm having trouble focusing to help me listen better. <laughs> so you have lots of different times that you can pull in this little bit to play with your ears. But now if you're able to, I would like you to stand up and we're going to do something for our whole body. And that's going to relate to our whole brain. So since I'm backing up, I have to switch glasses so I can still see you all. All right, we're going to do a cross crawl. So a lot of you said you go for walks. This is important. But what if, you know, you need to stay next to the trailer because your horse is buddy sour and really upset that it's alone right now. So what if you can't go for a walk? What could you do? And it's a simple activity called a cross crawl. So you just raise one leg, find your other arm, and bring them together. Other leg, other arm, Bring them together. So once you get going, it's just like walking. Super. 30 seconds is usually enough. You don't have to do this for hours on end. And again, how could you do this on a horse? So now sit back down and let's see how you might do it sitting because when you're on your horse, you're probably sitting. All right, so I see you sitting down. So now show me how you might do this sitting down. Great, right, so Leah's doing it. It's very simple. Just lift up one leg and bring the other arm across. 
So it doesn't have to be a gigantic, huge movement. You could do it even sitting on the horse to just wake up your core because we're working on your shoulders and your hips and having that awareness of where's my top, where's my bottom, where's my right, where's my left. And how are they all working together so that I can be the best rider I can be? So cross crawl, you can do standing, you can do it sitting, you could go in the trailer and lay down and do it lying down, like a sit up, like Pilates bicycles, you know, a cross crawl, a cross crawl sit up if I was lying down flat on the floor. Can everyone picture that? Okay. Lots of different ways to build that core strength. Super important for your riding to know where you are in space. Before we go on though, no one has said, who cares? Why do I wanna know where my rights and lefts are? I know I told you this was gonna be physical, but I wanna bring in one piece of your brain of how do you wanna be the best thinker you can be? Because you have a lot of choices to make when you're at a horse show. So what do you know, those of you that have taken biology or that are in horse bowl, what do you know when you move this side of your body, which side of your brain lights up? So she show, I see Catherine is showing the opposite side. So when I move this side of my body, this side of my brain lights up. When I move this side of my body, this side of my brain lights up. So when I do a cross crawl, I have both sides of my body moving and that's firing to both sides of my brain. So it's helping me to be whole brained. Does that matter in a barrel race? Right. Why does it matter? Because the right side of your brain likes kind of the big picture. So it looks at the whole arena. It looks at the dimensions. The left side of your brain likes the details. How far is it till I get to that barrel and how tight of a turn am I gonna make and which leg should be applying pressure and which leg should be loose and where should my hands be? All those things, that's all left brain details. So you want both sides, otherwise, You'll just be stuck at one barrel going in circles if just your left brain is working. Or you'll blow right past the barrel because if your right brain is working and looking at the whole picture, you're gonna miss the detail. So if that's, if that's speaking to you, I see people nodding, then a cross crawl might be a really good thing to do before you go out to do that event. To get yourself online, kind of to wake everything up. All right, any questions or comments about that? So what I'm gonna do is I have one other thing I wanna show you and then I, if there is time, we might do the one thing that Leah requested we do. So I wanna end with, okay, that's great, Cindy. Now I'm all active, I'm all revved up. Now I'm too hyper and my horse can sense that. So how can I, how can I power down if I'm someone that has too much energy? How can I calm down so I can focus? So what we're going to do is out of the vision work again, we're gonna take something I taught you last year and we're gonna build on it a little bit. So you're going to cross your ankles and you can do this sitting, you don't have to stand up. If you can stand up, it, that might be a good idea. Thumbs down, cross, Clap, kind of like a seal, down and up. So everything's resting on your midline, right? Your, art, your hands are right above your belly button, up on your chest. Your ankles are crossed. Now, what you're going to do is pretend you are in a cocoon and you're starting to work your way out. You're a butterfly and you want to hatch. So you're wiggling and you're twisting, you're moving your spine, you're waking every part up. You can go forward and you can go backward.
and breathe. You can do this with your eyes open. You can do this with your eyes closed. And when you feel like that's enough, put your feet flat on the floor and just touch your fingertips together. And now just take a, do a quick body scan and check in. How's your spine feel? Do you know where your feet are? Do you know where you are in space? And so all we did is we took this active place of crossing the midline and then we calmed it down by resting on the midline. So the variation that I gave you today is called the cocoon. So you think of a butterfly that's working on stretching its way out. So I'll just turn to the side so you can see that I'm just reaching with my head and my neck and I'm stretching forward and back and just wiggling all of my muscles. And how might that help to calm down your nervous system? That it just kind of wakes everything up, but in a more calming way than a cross crawl, which was very activating. All right, the one thing Leah was hoping that I would have time for, and since we were able to start early, I think we can squeeze it in is last year, I taught you an activity called core activation. So those of you that were there, you may remember it, but core activation is going to work on your core. So what is your core? If you think you know what your core is, put it in the chat before I give you the answer. When someone says, you should strengthen your core, what are they talking about? Yeah, the abs, the stomach, the abdominal area, it's actually even bigger than that. When we talk about core, we mean everything from the shoulders, all of this stuff, all the way down to the hips. So it's not just the tummy roll or the lower tummy, it's the upper tummy, it's the back muscles, it's the transverse ones on the sides, the obliques and all the muscles that go up here and underneath our ribs and around us. So it's that whole entire middle part of your body. You're right, Shelby. So we're just gonna go through this super quickly. There's not a lot of time. This could be a whole hour just on core activation. So let's just have fun with it and do it as a dance kind of. We're not gonna dance, so don't panic. No music. <laughs> and then if you have a partner with you, so if there's two people in the room, this is actually really nice to do with somebody else. So for example, if Leah was in this room with me, she would put her hand on my shoulder, here she comes, and I would lean forward into her hand. Okay, can you do that real quick? So see how she's just touching my shoulder and I'm just gonna push into her hand and then she's gonna go behind and I'm just gonna lean back. Do you see how subtle that is? I love this jacket because then you can see when I'm moving, right? Because it's got a stripe on it. And then we would do the other shoulder. So if you have a partner, the partner can help by identifying fronts and backs. All right. But a lot of you don't have a partner, so we're going to do it all by yourselves. Allison, you and Leah must have been in cahoots together that I had to do core activation again. <laughs> so here we go. If you can stand up, it's better standing. Take one shoulder and lean in a little bit with that shoulder. I'll stand to the side so you can see my stripes. Take that same shoulder and go back. Take your other shoulder, lean in, take that shoulder and go back. Good job. Now we're gonna do the hips. So take one hip, I'm just gonna put my hand here so you know where your hip is, and you're going to push in towards that hand. And then you need to go to the back, the back of your hip, and you're going to push your hip back into your hand. Other side, forward, and back. That was the simplest part. So if that felt like too much for you, you'll want to just play with those four things for a couple weeks. <laughs> but we're going to go on. We're going to make combinations. Put, imagine that you had someone putting a hand on each shoulder in the front. And so you're gonna take your both shoulders and come in. 
So kind of like you're collapsing and then both shoulders and go back like you're sticking your chest out. And then both hips are gonna come forward and both hips are going to go back. Very good. I like um, Elsie's doing that, just rocking back and forth, very good. Now, we're gonna work on sidedness, one side of your body, the front. So I'm doing my left first, I'm gonna have my shoulder and my hip both come forward and then both go back. Other side, both come forward and both go back. Are you feeling all sorts of muscles, like right here and right here? Now do opposites. This is very much like the cross crawl that we just did. One shoulder opposite hip are going to come forward and then they're going to go back. Other side comes forward and then has to go back. So that's part one. So if you made it that far, good job. I will put a handout for this up in that Google folder when we get it ready. Now, let's see how many people can make it through the second part. So now this is complex. We're going to start twisting. So if the front of my right shoulder is coming forward, the back of my left is going to go back. I'm going to go forward, back. See that twist? Now reverse it. Back, forward. Everyone got that? All right, let's see if one hip comes forward, the other one has to go back. And then I'm gonna switch. So if, like Elsie's doing just the pattern, I'm just gonna pattern, it's almost like I could take off walking when I do that. So now one side, the top is gonna go forward and then the back has to go backward. Oh, my twist just got really interesting, didn't it? Okay, so if this side's coming forward, the bottom is gonna go back. And then I'm going to switch. Oh, we're almost done. Now we're ready for the cross. If the top right comes forward, the back left has to go backward. Come back to neutral and reverse it. And then we switch. If this comes forward, this has to go back. There was a question asking, should you bend your knees at all? It doesn't matter. You can bend your knees. You, don't, you probably don't want them to be locked. Especially with this one, you would bend your knees. If I did it with my knees locked, that probably is gonna cause quite a bit of lower back tension, I think. All right, that's core activation. Often if you're noticing your knees are locked, that tells you you're in a learning state and you're maybe trying hard. And so you might know some kids that, that toe walk or when they're getting stressed, you can really see that in the way that they get on the horse or the way that they are on the horse that it looks like they're all locked up. That often has to do with the knees being locked and not able to bend and flex. So you want kind of looseness versus lockedness. I don't even think that's a word. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go back to share screen just for the closing. How's everyone doing? That made me out of breath to have to talk through it, think through it, and do it all at once. All right, so you'll get a handout with some really ugly stick figures with arrows pointing at the shoulders and hips and telling you what goes forward and what goes back. So you'll be able to access that. Also, I think that Leah and I did a video on this last spring at the beginning of COVID that we did some movement meetups that we posted on YouTube. So they're on my YouTube channel that you can go watch a video and be guided through it. And I think if I remember right, Leah, that's when you had a broken hand and a cast on. <laughs> I think yeah. I think we did the whole core activation. All right, so if we jump back over to here. So just in closing, you know, our time's almost up. Go back to the car analogy. 
how exercise and nutrition can affect your writing. I'm hoping you got some ideas today of it really does affect the way that you perform, what you put in your body affects and whether you take time to warm yourself up, whether you take time to help yourself if you do get bucked off or if you do have a bad run or you didn't get the ribbon you wanted. You know, how, what can you do to support yourself? And so I just thought I would summarize it in three short words. If you feel like you're broken down, hey, I missed a word there. If you feel like you are broken down, what a bummer, I just corrected that when you were playing horse bowl. <laughs> There's three things that you could do. Hydrate, here's my water bottle. I'm terrible at drinking water, so I had to buy a water bottle with the ounces on it that says, hey, Cindy, by 8 a.m. you should be down to this line. By 1 p.m. it should be empty and you should refill it for the afternoon. So I needed a little help with that, but hydrate. And then the second one is oxygenate. How many things did we do today that I reminded you to breathe? And if you, those of you that were there last year, we talked a lot about breathing. So notice when you're feeling any stress or if your writing isn't going the way you want, are you breathing? And then finally, what you all said in the chat, get moving, be active. If you're wanting to help yourself, go for a quick walk. That that can be so very helpful. Do some stretches. So I teach a lot of specific strategies, but I wanted to give you some specifics with some generals today. So with that, I think there's only one thing left, and it is, if you have any questions about what you learned today, this is some different ways that you can find me or reach me. You can email, you can use my website. Again, there's an email on there. There's all sorts of free boot camps and videos and things you can get ideas. YouTube, my channel is really complicated. It's Cindy Goldaddy. And my vision and mission is to unlock the door to learning so that we all can have success. Cindy, there was one final question. What is it? If you are stronger or stiffer on one side than the other, what are some things you can do? Say you are sitting uneven in the saddle to the right or the left. That is a great question. And I would do the exact things that I showed you today just to help you get more even on your laterality, more even awareness of your muscles. So I wouldn't go into a strength training program necessarily. I would first want to just work with body awareness and making sure your mind and your body are communicating together. So core activation, the reason Allison and Leah both thought that was so great is it just does so much for so many muscle groups. It helps you become aware of them to know where they are so that if your trainer says, you know, loosen up your left side, you know what that means. Where is my left? Because right now we have so many of us with so much sitting that we do that we aren't aware of where we are in space. And what that looks like, if you take a preschooler, it's when they're running to talk to you and they run all the way until they crash into you, that they don't know when to stop. Or it's someone that falls down a lot or is just kind of klutzy because it's that lack of knowing where am I without looking down to make sure my leg is still attached, okay? That's a great question. One, one more. Mm -hmm. If you ride with one hip forward in the saddle, what should you do? Um, and it's uneven. I would do a lot of the bottom part of the core activation. So, and especially do it with a partner. When you're doing it with yourself, it's easy to fake it and just say, yeah, I got my hip forward. But what you're looking at, Leah, if you could come in here real quick. What you're looking at is if I put my hand on my hip or if I, have someone else put their hand on my hip. Can I actually move in? So can I do you? So if I put my hand here, I'm looking at, can she actually figure out how to move her body that direction? <laughs> and then if I go to the back, I am able to feel as her partner, could she find back? Does she know where back is? And that ability to isolate those different muscles will help you to get more balance. So when you have a partner that's using hands, that just gives you a lot more physical input of, oh, because a lot of times what you'll see, put your hand right here. 
So if she's inviting me to push forward, I might first go in a whole circle as I look for forward. That my body's like searching, 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 kind of like when your computer spins. So good questions. Kendall, use some of the things that we did before. I'm gonna just stop screen sharing. And our time is up, how was that? Phew.